This Restorative Justice Life is a production of Amplify RJ. Follow us on all social media platforms at Amplify RJ or sign up for our email list to stay up to date on everything we have going on. And to get the most involved, join our free Mighty Networks community to get connected with others living this restorative justice life all over the world. As far as this podcast goes, make sure you're subscribed, leave a rating and review, and share with a friend to help us further amplify this work. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to This Restorative Justice Life, the podcast that explores how the philosophy, practices, and values of restorative justice apply to our everyday lives. I'm your host, David Ryan Barcega Castro Harris, all five names for the ancestors, and I'm the founder of Amplify RJ. On this podcast, I talk with RJ practitioners, circle keepers, and others doing this work about how this way of being has impacted their lives. Fred, welcome to This Restorative Justice Life. Who are you? Oh, just a brother from the South Side trying to help his people. <laughs> Who are you? Oh, just a father that's trying to lead his daughter to greatness. Who are you? Uh, a man who just wants more for, for, for my people on the South Side of Chicago and all over the world. Who are you? A uh, working man, a great father, and a man. One day, hopefully, I'll be a great husband. Who are you? Oh man, just a a a a a great person overall. Who are you? Oh man, just I'm I'm a, I'm a I'm a great facilitator. I'm a, a financial literacy uh, facilitator, just trying to do great work. And then last for now, who are you? Oh, okay, just a great man overall. A great man. <laughs> Oh my goodness, Fred, it's been a minute since we really got to sit down and talk. We saw each other briefly last summer, but now yes. first podcast of 2023. Um, really glad to be having this conversation. It's always good to check in to the fullest extent that you want to answer the question right now. How are you? Oh, I'm doing amazing. I'm doing amazing. Uh, feeling real good. Just got back from uh, the Bahamas from vacation. I'm feeling real good. I got some good rest. Just seeing those, that, bit of that beautiful view, looking at that, the beautiful water, just getting that relaxation in, great food, uh, great shopping, uh, just a great experience overall. Love to hear it. And I know like as soon as you got back here, I'm sure you hit the ground running. And we're going to get to all the things you have, ju- you've got juggling in a moment. But, you know, you've been doing restorative justice work for a minute. Um, and, you know, the words, quote unquote, restorative justice, I think came to you around the same time as they came to me. But you've been doing work like this in this vein for even longer. So uh, how did this journey get started for you? Oh, wow. I've been doing restorative justice since 2015, and uh, how did it get started? Wow, that's a great question. So it started all at home. I was watching Netflix, and I was watching a series called Chicago Land, and um, there was a guy on there, Robert Spicer, and um, he was doing circles, peace circles in the um, Finger High School on the south side. And it was a segment in the on the series on that. So I was watching it and I just said, Well, what is what the heck is this? And so as I'm sitting there eating my cereal watching this, I said, Oh man, I got I gotta learn this. I just got to. So long story short, I end up working at St. Agatha on the West Side. Well, hold and, up, uh, hold up. This is a podcast. Tell the long story. <laughs> okay, okay, no problem. So the long story was long story. So watching this on Netflix, so um I ended up, uh, I was looking for employment, got hired at St. Agatha as as a janitor, as a janitor, at, oh yeah, with Father Larry over at St. Agatha Church, and I uh, was working for, as a janitor for about two, three months with Father Larry, then uh, he said, uh, hey, uh, we got a, a training coming up on restorative justice, would you like to take part of it? And I was like, oh yeah, I just seen that uh, a few, a few, uh, a few uh, months ago, I was watching it at the house, yeah, I would, would love to. And he was like, oh, yeah, so, okay, I'll put you down. So he put me down. So day one of the training, I walk in. Who's doing the training? Robert Spicer. And I was like, oh, man, I seen you on TV. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like, yeah, I didn't make no money off of it, but it helped my platform. And I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, oh, my God. So I wanted to meet you. It was great. Four-day training. So the four-day training, we got to it. Four-day training. Oh, man, it was amazing. I remember it like yesterday. Uh, it was just so amazing sitting in the peace circles and learning the values, the guidelines, and I was just, I knew I was hooked in. 
And so, yeah, that's how I got started. That's how I got started seven years ago by actually sitting at home, eating a bowl of cereal, watching an episode on Chicago, man. <laughs> Love that. Love that. And, you know, for folks who have been long, long time listeners of the podcast, I think Robert Spicer is, he was definitely one of the first 10. I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not remembering which episode it was, but go back, scroll back in the archives yeah. and our conversation with him is there. And, you know, he talks about some of the work that he did at Finger yeah. um, and lots of other things, but, you know, to have him um, as one of the first people who trained you, you know, you talked about values and guidelines and feeling hooked. What was it about that experience of sitting in space with Robert and whoever else was in that training for four days? Like what got you hooked? Oh, easy. So when I, uh, like I said, when I was watching the Chicago Land, I was watching this series. So when I seen like the values, the guidelines and sitting in the circle with those people and then everybody was like, oh, I'm not judgmental. We just telling our stories and everybody was just telling stories. So me, you, I mean, David, you know my background and my history. So when even when I explained my background in history, it was just non-judgmental. It was just like all love pouring in on each other. And so when I seen that, I said, oh, man, I got to take this to the neighborhood. I got, I just got to take this to some schools. This this, this process and sitting in this circle, this peace circle, it was, just, it was just amazing to me. Yeah. I mean, I know your background, the people yeah. who are listening don't oh, necessarily yeah. I, know I, I and, so, when, and so when you say like it's a non-judgmental space right um there are things in your background that a lot of people judge um as much as you want to share oh, yeah. you know uh I don't have a problem. yeah how did you like why was being in a non-judgmental space like that so unique for you Oh, because, you know, like I say, I come from the south side of Chicago and, and uh, my life, I got into the uh, street life very early in life at 14, started selling drugs and things like that. Uh, I've been shot 10 times, been to jail uh, several times. And so that street life, I was a part of that life. I was raised on that life. And so when I sat in this circle, usually when I'm, I'm, I'm telling this story, I'm being judged like, oh, he's this, he's that. But when I sit this in this circle, it was just like a whole nother, okay, like, wow, like, they really, like, understood. Like, they wasn't listening to judge. They was basically listening to understand. Right. And so, yeah, and so it just made me want to just tell even more and more and more and more. And just in that process, I just wanted to be a part of that process. I just knew I had to be a part of it. Right. So while like that training was not specifically for like, hey, let's bring Fred into a space where he doesn't feel judged and feels comfortable in the space, like having that, having experienced that, right, made you feel like, oh, I know so many other people who need this. I need to learn how to do this. I need to continue to do this. And, you know, here we are, what is this, seven, eight years later. And yes. that's, that's been the thing that, that you've been doing. Where did it go from that four-day training for you? So that four-day training, wow, that four-day training led to me actually going to a high school on the west side, Collins High School. And uh, I sat in a circle with those kids for like once a week and uh, just was, we, you know, we did our values guidelines and we did our circles and it was going very well, very, very well. You know, the, the uh, students over there, you know, they was expressing themselves and they weren't being judged. And so they loved it. We're doing icebreak because we have a fun. And so, I, like I said, I was only going once a week. That once a week turned to twice a week. They wanted more. So I started going twice a week and uh, just started building with them uh, and, and the, uh, in that space. And so one day we got approached, I got approached by a county sheriff to actually come to Cook County and do service. And I'm like, uh, no, I'm going to county jail and do no peace circles. And then one day I was, you know, as uh, I ride to work uh, from St. Agatha because I'm on the south side going to the west side, I would always ride past uh, the county. And then one day it hit me like, you're going to be working in there. I'm like, no, I just never wanted to work in there. But sat down with the sheriff, end up um, negotiating just to come in there on, uh, just to see how it would go. And so it was 40, it was uh, 40 guys that was locked on this, on this one deck we went on. And um, well, so we went, we talked to them and tried to see how many wanted to actually join the peace circle. So it was 40, but only seven joined. So I was like, okay, good. That's a start. So we get these seven guys. We're doing circle for uh, maybe like two months. And so they that those seven goes back on deck and tell the other guys about the peace circle. And so now when I come back, I got 40 guys that want to sit in the circle. 
So I'm like, oh my God. So now it's growing. And so now I start on one division in Cook County uh, Correctional Facility. That turns into two. Now, then it just turned all over to four. Now I'm all over the county jail. Now I got an all division pass. When I come in, I just had one division I'm on. Now I got an all division pass. I can go all over. And it just spread it through Cook County like rapidly. So I've been there now for seven years now doing it over there. And then that turned into the restorative justice a community court in North Lawndale. They asked me to come over there. And so I started doing three circles over there. That went great. And then from North Lawndale, uh, they wanted to start the one in uh, the restorative justice community court in Inglewood. And so by me being from the South side, they asked me to come over there. And I just kept saying, no, because these courts, it's a lot of work. I want to be a part of it, man. I've done it. Sat over here in North Lawndale for three years. I don't want a part of that no more. The coordinator, uh, Marlo, she just kept asking me, asking me, asking me until finally I broke down and just said, okay. And so I've been doing peace circles now for over seven years. Yeah. You know, we, you've used the framework of circles. Uh, you've talked about the framework of circles. And, you know, when people think about restorative justice and a, and a restorative justice circle, a peace circle, oftentimes um, they're thinking about a time and a process where somebody is repairing harm we're addressing a specific issue or like working with somebody to meet their needs or figure out how they can repair harm that's been a part of the work that you've done but you know initially when you were introduced to circles with robert spicer and then initially when you started doing circles at collins high school and we should say that saint agatha and collins high school are on the west side in the north lawndale neighborhood for those that don't know their chicago geography um yeah. you know th those circles weren't about that Right, those circles were like, wh what was the purpose of those circles for you? And even like when you were going into the county jail, the circles weren't for like, hey, we're gonna repair harm, we're gonna like fix. Like, what was your intention and what was the space that you were building for those folks to be able to do? Oh, easy, that's easy. Oh, for me, building relationships, creating building relationships is number one. I always tell people, like, they when they even when they ask me what is circles for you, I said, number one is building relationships. I don't know you, you don't know me, let's build. Number two, building trust because. You know, the neighborhood that I'm from, a lot of trust is just not there. And so now you've got somebody that you can sit and talk to and don't be judged, just building that, that trust. We build a community and we just build it with each other in an overall space. And then it was a it was a great idea to go in Cook County Jail because here you have guys that's been judged all their lives. And so now they're sitting in this space. And when I came in there, I had certain criteria and circles that I went by, which is I don't want a sheriff standing over my circle. It's not going, I don't want to do it. I don't even want to do it. I want these guys to know that anything they say in here is confidential. And so I made that be known because that's the that's that's a part of that circle process of being confidential. It don't matter where it said Cook County on the outside, it doesn't matter. I have to I apply those same my same uh, uh guidelines go apply in Cook County jail. So just building that trust, building that camaraderie with guys, and just building that openness, letting them just say being being able to say something without being judged. Because you got to remember, this is a jail. They're used to being judged. They've been judged every day. So now when I come in, I'm creating this safe space for them to say what they want and what they feel. It went amazing. Yeah. I'd love to hear both in Cook County and at Collins High School, like what you did. Because in both places, you are not staff. You are not an employee no. of Collins High School. No. You are not an employee of Cook County Jail. And so like when you're coming in, like people should or understandably have their guard up like who's this why is he here why yes. should i trust this person what are the yes. things that you did to build trust in both of those spaces i'm sure there were some similarities but i also know that there were some differences oh so one of the things that i when i went into both collins high school and cook county correctional facility is i told my story and so when i told my story i just let it be known hey since 14, hey, I've been in these streets. Hey, I've been shot 10 times. Hey, I've been in jail. Hey, I'm not here to judge you. I've done some of the same things you guys did. So there's no judgment on my part. So even when I went to the school, same thing. I let them know my story. So by me telling my story and opening up to them first, it allowed them to get comfortable and tell me their stories. And so the, the circles in both those places were amazing because guess what? It was nothing but truth being spread. It was being spread around in these, in these circles. And 
And like, I was telling them about my everyday life and things that I was going through as a single father raising my daughter. Hey, this is what I'm going through. And so now they was telling me about their families. And so it seemed like every time that I would open up and tell them my truth, they would come right back and tell me their truth. And so I've heard several stories about, you know, like people losing family, losing relatives, you know, students lost their brothers and it, it circles got emotional sometimes. And it was just, it, it just got so deep. And I, and I enjoyed those spaces because those places in schools and our, in our prisons, some of them don't get those, that, 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 that time to have peace circles and express themselves in a way where they're not being judged. Yeah. You know, schools are different than prisons in in many ways and there yeah. are similarities in that you know folks have to be there <laughs> um like right you know students do have some choice students do get to go home students in some cases get to decide where they want to go to school but like once you're a part of that school like there are just certain things that you have to do i i know you know the the circles that you do in cook county those are opt-in right um you know it is best practice to have people in circle who like want to volunteer, who voluntarily want to be there, right? Um, both when you're having a restorative process um, and when you're just building community, people not wanting to be in that space is going to be detrimental to um, that space. And, you know, I love the example of, you know, you started with seven and like, they're like, oh, no, nah, this is cool. Like we can invite mm -hmm. other people into the work, you know, yeah. it, it, it's a, it's really the the spirit of this work. You talked about like building relationship, building trust. You you led with your own vulnerability, right? Not everyone has the story of like, hey, I grew up in this situation. I overcame these barriers. But everyone has a story, right? You should yes. not tell Fred's story to build relationship with people yeah. <laughs> who like have who you perceive have similar stories, right? Like you know my story. Uh, folks who listen to this podcast know like, you know, a lot of the roots in restorative justice work come from working with people who have been encountering the criminal legal system, right? And wanting to not just find um, quote unquote felon friendly employers for those who, you know, have encountered the criminal legal system, but, you know, what are the ways to subvert that? Because I've had so many folks who I've worked with, like, put in their applications, have them thrown in the trash when they fill it out honestly, or get fired two weeks later when the background check comes back. And yes. so, you know, the people who I've built relationships with, and I care about like wanting to make changes, like motivates me to want to continue to do this work. Nobody gets into restorative justice work for like the money, the fame, the riches, the <laughs> right, right. You know, when people know that you're there for for a reason that that you care, um, they're more willing to like opt into the process. And you know, if they have a similar background to you, like there's often space for you to connect more quickly, more easily. But even if you don't have that similar background, just knowing that someone's showing up authentically, um, who they are, sharing, being willing to share their life, their stories with you. Is super important yes yes and that's the thing david you know when we uh do this restorative work one one thing we know we're not doing it is for the money we know we're not doing it there so when i even went to cook county jail one of the things that i also told them is we're not making this mandatory because they were saying hey we can get the whole deck to come in here i said no 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 no, no. we're not doing that we're going to ask these guys and give them that choice because that's what restorative justice is about this is a non-judgmental process and also is it is not a mandate it's not mandatory we don't want to make it mandatory it's a volunteer it's, it's a volunteer it's a volunteer basically even with the courts you know we say hey this is for you you don't have to accept this you can still go the same when you catch a case you can still go to 26 it's up to you if you want to take this so it's the same approach that i took when I was in Cook County Jail saying, hey, we, this is not mandatory. And I told the, all the guards and everybody said, no, we're not making this mandatory. We're going to make it violent. If they want to volunteer to do this, that's what it's, it's up to them because I don't want nobody sitting in. We don't want them sitting in a circle and that's not what they want to do. And then also you have to remember, I'm coming in with a centerpiece, uh, some talking pieces in the middle of the floor in Cook County Jail. So they looking like, what the hell is this voodoo stuff right here he got going on? So that can throw him off. So it was just just even explaining the process to them was 
it was that was a, 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 a hump right then within itself. Like, let me explain this. Like, okay, we gonna be sitting and we gonna be like, what? Like, what are you talking about? Ain't nobody sitting. I ain't gonna sit with this dude and tell my story. Absolutely not. I ain't doing that. So I got that kickback, which was the challenge, and I knew I was gonna have a challenge. And so once I really got those seven, and we just started just sharing our stories and. And just going, no, noticing we got some of the same values in life, and notice that you know, even though I'm from a, 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 uh, I might be from the south, you might be from the west, but realizing man, we got a lot of the same, same things going on here. We we got some of the same things, and so now the same person that I probably would have never talked to in life because he's from over here and I'm from over here. Now we sit in this circle. It's like, man, I, I didn't even know you was that cool like this. Like, hey, like, dude. And, and that's how it went. It's just, it was just the perfect place to do it. And it just, it just went so well. Yeah. I mean, you talked about the challenges of people not wanting to, like, be vulnerable and share, like, both with you and, like, you know, the other people who they might have been at ops with, right, at, at, at yeah. a different time in a different circumstance. But, you know, the the process of sitting down together in that way right where we have these values we have these agreements about you know being together a certain way confidentially non-judgmentally um it does allow people's walls to come down and to uh start to connect on on a different level you know i similarly did some work in, in cook county jail and it was under different circumstances right it was still opt-in right but the the circumstances that i came in were that, you know, they they were asking for these restorative programs, and what what was confusing for me and what hurt me is, you know, I would come in the next week, right, and then like half the people would be gone, um, and that that happened for a number of reasons. Sometimes it was for great reasons; they were released and they were back home. Wonderful. Sometimes something popped off, right, and that person was sent to another block. Someone else was sentenced, and you know, sent. Um, sent down state um, to, to prison. Um, but, you know, when the things that happen like on, on the decks happen between folks and, and there was a fight, right? Um, I always question like, why couldn't we have handled this restoratively, yes, right? Yeah. I, I'm curious, like if you had things like that happen in your circumstance and how you dealt with that. Mm, great question, great one. So, Recently, we had a situation in Cook County where, like, where some guys had gotten into an altercation. And um, similar to what you said, like, uh, yeah, we separated the guys and, you know, we on half and half. And, you know, what's half the guys are out there sales and half the guys are locked in. And so what I explained to one of the sheriffs is that's the point of us coming. That's the point of this. This is the point. This just ain't a feel good session. It's, it's just not about that. This is to sit and say, hey, well, you know, let's get to the root of this. What happened? Who was harmed? What caused the harm? How do we stop this from happen ha happening for future for future situations? It, that's the part of this. That's why we're here. And so I just actually, and it's, and, it's, and it's funny that you just mentioned that because I just actually sent the email out to a chef and said, that's that's what this is about. And so just just keep locking people and sending them to, you know, uh, hey, consolidatory filing and, and all this other stuff. That's what we try. That's what restorative justice for me is trying to avoid. I'm putting you in a 23 and one situation. Hey, let, how do we solve this amongst us and solve this amongst us? So it's, it's just... Yeah, have they said, let so. you have they let you come together and like try to resolve those? That's or are they still operating on? on? Yeah, that's what we're working on right now because, like I told him, I've been here too long now. It's stuff going on because on my on the deck that I was working on, like for months, nothing was going on. Every week, we would all just continue to sit in a circle every week, every week, nothing was going on. So, when something did happen. They went back to they, them, them old ways of lockdown and this. And I said, no, we, that's why we're here. We're here to try to avoid those lockdown situations. And so that's what I'm working with now with one of the county sheriffs is bringing that circle back to say, hey, how, how do we sit down and get to the root of this? Yeah. I mean, I'm, 
I, like part of me is like not surprised <laughs> at all, right? Because like it's still a jail, right? They're yes. going to act um, in ways that people who work in a jail act like the system still works in the ways that the that the system is working. But like it's 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 inspiring to hear that like you know because of the relationships you've built over the last couple of years, like people are more willing to like put that trust in you to deal with deal with this another way that is not actually causing more harm, right? You have the skills to help uh, solve those situations in a, a way that doesn't cause more harm. But like, you know, the guys also have the capacity <laughs> to, you know, work things out um, between each other. And, you know, this is not a convers like this podcast is not a conversation like talking about how like terrible prison and the criminal legal system is because like everybody who I imagine is listening to this agrees, right? We don't have to go into like all of those reasons, but, you know, it, it's helpful to hear that like, even while those systems exist, while we dream of them not existing, um, we can still do some really good work. Um, I want to take I want to take this two places, and I'll let you decide where we go right now. Because while you've worked in prisons, it, sorry, in j in jail, right? You've also done work um, doing financial literacy classes yeah. for those folks and you've done work like out like tangential to that system next to that system in courts you want to do financial literacy or do you want to do courts both well no yeah but uh, like where do you want to do first yeah. yeah yeah oh wow Ooh, which one? Uh, let's talk about financial literacy right so okay so i i love how you come in and like you do have spaces like that are just dedicated to sharing and building relationship but, you know, so many of the reasons that folks who are incarcerated are because, like, they were doing something to to make money for themselves, right? They're in yes. bad economic situations and are trying to figure out um, how to not be in that uh, situation anymore. You brought in financial literacy courses as a, yes, as a um, to, to help them take better steps and make better decisions coming out. Um, how did that get started? What, what got you into that financial literacy space? And like, you know, how did you, uh, how have you been translating that into uh, courses that you've been teaching? Oh, wow. So a friend of mine, uh, she uh, knew about a financial literacy class that was going on at the bank uh, over here on 63rd and uh, West and um, Marquette Bank. She was like, man, I really think you should take this um, financial literacy class. I'm like, no. Cool, my, I'm pretty good with my finances. I'm cool. She was just like, no, nah, I think you could really benefit from it. So I'm like, no, I don't really need that. Like, nah, I'm pretty good with my finances. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to go. And it was on a Saturday. So that's one, one of the reasons why I really didn't want to go. That's my day off. I'm going to no class, no day off. But I ended up going. And uh, it was a brother teaching the class that I'm pretty sure you know. His name is Mashan. Oh, he yeah. was actually the one doing the class. Yeah, and um, we started, uh, when I seen him doing it, I realized then, I said, I get it. I said, this class ain't for, it wasn't for really for me. So it's just for me to learn and then teach it. It just hit me right then and there. Because when I was seeing him doing it, I was just like, oh, I see what he's doing. I don't know what I can do. I was just looking at him as like a mentor just saying like, I see what he's doing. I can take this same thing, just mix it up a little bit, add some more, add some more curriculum to it, and just go to Cook County Jail and explain it to the guys in a way that they could understand. And that's what I did. Yeah. So, so, so what is it that you're teaching now? So when I go in there with the guys in the, in the county, uh, we talk. We go over credit. We go over savings. We go over uh, insurance. We go over. We make. I help them make budgets. Um, we talk about predatory lending. We talk about the importance of a credit score. We talk about well, so many topics. It's just it's just been amazing because one of the reasons why I chose financial literacy because I looked at it like this. I said because uh, you know I got young you, know, you know I'm from that and then I, I looked at it like saying hey if I can teach these guys how to get credit scores up and how to budget money better maybe if they got these credit scores and things up. They probably wouldn't so be so quick to reoffend. Yeah, definitely. And you know, how did it go from you know you were doing circles for relationship building, you know, trust building, all that? What was their reaction from like, oh, we're we're here for this. Now we're here for something else. What was right. that like? And it, yeah. Great question, David. Great question. So the reason why 
uh, I brought financial literacy into those guys is, uh, I looked at it like this, a lot of them is in there for, for, for drugs. So I said, hmm, a lot of them, if I'm looking at this financial literacy class, we talk about entrepreneurship. I talk about uh, L, uh, LLCs, uh, making your own business. So I looked at it like this. I said, well, they know how to sell. They know how to promote. They know how to market. They know how to do all these things a regular company does. It's just they're not just the only thing that's missing is they're not doing it legally. How about if I come in and show them how to get their LLC, their legal business, and show them how to do certain things, they already doing it, but just turn this to a legal thing, they'll probably take this the legal way and do things the right way. And so since I've been in there, a lot of the guys that come out get their LLCs and they people like, man, I got my I got my LLC, man, I'm finna start this trucking business, man, I'm finna start this, I'm finna start, I'm finna start this little mentorship and just and so now I look at that as it all started in Cook County Jail, just doing the restorative justice, then listening to these guys and saying, they are good with money. A lot of them make money. They know how to make it. It's just they don't know how to manage it. Mm. And so when I when I took the class the, the, at the bank, I sat down. I started getting all this, doing all this research and got me a curriculum together and presented it to Cook County Jail. They was, they was amazed by it. And it's been in there for over four years now. Yeah, and you've shared a couple of the uh, the outcomes of that, right? Uh, yeah. Are there any stories specifically that are like, oh yeah, like I'm really glad that um, this worked for for one of the people who you worked with? Oh yeah, I got one of the like I said, I got one of the brothers that started his own trucking business. We was talking about it. he got his LLC, he got his business credit together, and he just always thanked me for it started just sitting in Cook County, and I got a, and I got another guy. Um, like just just the small stories. Open his first bank account. I got plenty of those. That just open their first bank account. Got my first credit card. Things that we have on a daily basis that we feel that is nothing is 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 big to them. Opening your first credit card, getting your first bank account, uh, getting your credit score up, and it's those those small things that we do every day for us, but. To the people from the guys that's in there, they just didn't know nothing about it. Right, right. And I'm thinking so much about, you know, where, where I come from in this work, right? An employment program, yeah. helping people find work. And the reason that people can't find work, like as much as like ban the box legislation has uh, been removed and, you know, there have been initiatives um, on state and on some, to some extent, federal levels to like, give people second chances when they are applying for jobs, having a felony on their record that m may not have been expunged yet. Right. Those opportunities, like that's still a barrier for people. Like the judgment is still there. And like this way of entrepreneurship and being able to, um, you know, hold it down for yourself, knowing how to manage your money once it comes in, yeah. um, yeah. is, is so important. You know, I mean, that's in a lot of ways what you're doing. Like, I know you have like multiple streams of income coming in from, from different places, but, you know, having those skills, instilling that in your kid, right. Um, is, is, is important and such a beautiful thing. Yeah. So big ups. Thank you. One of those other ways that you're bringing money in is the work that you're doing with the courts. You like that segue. Um, you know, you worked in um, <laughs> the the North Lawndale rendition of the uh, restorative justice community court. Um, you're now working in Inglewood. Um, tell us what that experience is like. There have been, uh, and before I, I let you go, you know, there have been other episodes of this podcast where, you know, people have heard about this restorative justice community court in North Lawndale, but Tell it from your perspective, <laughs> because because not everybody listens to every not everyone listens to every episode, yeah. and you have a unique perspective. So, <laughs> go for it. Wow, that <laughs> as much as you're willing to share. <laughs> oh wow, that was a. Oh, let me get back here in one second. So that that was a hell of an experience over there in North Lawndale, but. <laughs> I wouldn't take him back for the world. Uh, because I think the challenges over at North Lawndale was because we were the first ever uh, restorative justice court in Illinois. 
And so the challenges was one, the biggest challenge for me, for, for me was we got, you know, we, we got to get a staff that knows restorative justice. That was a big challenge for me because it's like, how I, I can I lead a community and talk about restorative justice and I really don't know what I'm doing? And so that was a big challenge for me. And I was just telling, like, I always talk to the judge. I said, we need to get everybody trained in this. We need to just wait before we just open this door of saying restorative. And a lot of us just don't know about it. I mean, I, I have been in season for about like two and a half years when the court started over there. But, you know, people was just filling out applications and getting hired and hired. Well, I'm this and I'm this and I got this position. And it's like, okay, like, how are we going to lead people like, who are the peace circle keepers in? How does this work? How many circles have they done? And so it was the, the challenge for me. How many circles was, have they done? How many circles have they even sat in? <laughs> yeah, that. Like, how many have you sat in? Because, like, for me, I, before I even started doing any circles, David, I had just sat and watched for over a year and a half. I said, I don't want to leave none. I just want to learn. I sat in a circle with Cheryl and them for uh, did several trainings with them. Before I even did one on my own, and so now, now I'm a little, a little seasoned. Get over to this court, and I was just looking like, okay, uh, we didn't show value using guidelines when we start this, but it was a lot of great work that was done, and I, and um, we start, we 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 started. Um, what was that? 2017, 2018. I said 2017, and uh, it was uh, like I said, it was very, very, very challenging, very challenging. From just our participants trying to explain to them what restorative justice is and the process to them, and they like, well, what is this? And I'm I just came over here because my lawyer sent me in, not really understanding that process, and so it was it was it was very very difficult. But I will say a lot of progress was made over there. A, a, a lot of progress was made. I want to like round out some of the the texture of this, right? Like okay. there are some like really, really well-intentioned people who see problems with the way that the traditional criminal legal system operates and right wanted a restorative alternative. Folks who listen to this podcast and Fred, you know, like I'm not someone who's like, hey, let's bring restorative justice into courts for exactly this reason, right? Because people yeah. who run courts want to run a court. <laughs> Right. Court. Yes. <laughs> right. That is not and like, oh, let's like infuse restorative justice into like mm. That's not, but like that that doesn't work. Um, and you know, y'all have in North Lawndale and in Inglewood, like things look different because there are different people involved, different relationships, different ideas about what restorative justice is, right? But when that comes, when those well-intentioned people come without like a foundation, a deep knowledge of restorative justice, like there leaves a lot of room for misunderstandings, um, slow starts, tension. From people in the community not to mention like and the people who get like most impacted by this are the people who are going through the process right you talk about um the guys who are coming through you're like i don't know what this is i just caught this case and my lawyer said i'm gonna do this right yeah. <laughs> and you know to their credit so many of them um did everything that was asked of them can you talk about some of the successes um uh, of you know what that process looked like and some of the outcomes I mean, Confidentiality, of course, right? <laughs> of course, of course. Oh, wow. We had a lot of success. Oh, a lot of success. We had over 30 cases that got dismissed. Uh, some of the success of the court because we were just taking like, um, we always, well, we still are taking first time nonviolent felony cases, but we were able to actually get gun cases in there now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and even in uh, uh, in, uh North Lawndale also. And so the success was, like I said, getting over 30 cases dismissed, um, seeing a lot of uh, the participants go on and go to college, graduate. Uh, a lot of them even get just regular, get get, get employment, that, that barrier is not there, having that felony on their background. Uh, it, it was a lot of success. A lot of, yeah, a lot of success, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the you say like case getting dismissed. So if someone goes through a restorative process, um, completes their like their repair of harm agreements, right? Yes. Um, they get their cases dismissed. Like what are some examples of like those agreements that they completed, right? Because like like you were saying, like these were like nonviolent um, felonies where like there's not always necessarily like an aggrieved party, right? Like yes. So like what were the repair of harm 
type of things oh, that folks were doing? What they look like? Oh, great question. So uh, attend a financial literacy class would be one. Uh, go and get your high school diploma or GED would be one. Gain employment would be one. Um, uh, uh, go, to a, go seek mentorship would be one. Uh, go to therapy would be another one. Um, what would be another one? Doing a vision board would be one. Yeah, that was, yeah, yeah. We had a lot of great things. So I, I, I would love one thing I love was the vision board one because it was actually given our, especially our young participants, that time to do a vision board and see the vision for themselves for their own lives. I always love that process and uh, just yeah, the gaining employment, going to school, going back to school, uh, furthering your education, going to college. Um, uh, just it was it was several great things that would be in there. Once they completed, that case would get dismissed, and they would go on go to the expungement process, get it expunged, and then they would go back to back to back to the, back to not having those cases and not having to worry about those barriers in life. Yeah, and you know, a lot of the times when we think about a lot of times when people think about restorative justice, it's um, this person punched this person in the face. What are we going to do to repair the harm? That wasn't yeah. the case within. Those weren't the type of cases that you were dealing with um, in the context of of this uh, community court. Um, but when we're talking about repair of harm, you know, we talk about restorative justice being about relationships. The first relationship you have is the relationship with yourself, right? And so yes. if you're putting yourself in a position where these these choices to cause harm to yourself or others. Um, are, or your community are the things that you're opting into. What are the things that you can do to put yourself in a better position where you can make more positive choices? You know, I'll argue that like, we don't need court involvement at all to like provide those resources. You to and people. me both. Right, <laughs> right, right. And- You know how like, I feel about the process. And like, if we have people who are willing to allocate these resources, once people get caught up, we'll work with it. And like, to your point, like people getting the, these cases dismissed um, is a beautiful thing. Are there any differences between what's uh, gone on in Inglewood from like what you experienced in North Lawndale? Hmm, that's a great question. Uh, hmm. I think with me being with, being from, coming from North Lawndale and being in Inglewood, it was a more easier transition. And the transition was easier because now I'm taking the experience that I had from North Lawndale and bringing it over to Inglewood. So now I'm able to now same thing with this court. A lot of a lot of people just really don't know about RJ, really don't know about the process. But now now I'm really seasoned. Now I'm five, six years in the game. So now I can say, hey, this is how repair harm agreement goes. This is how this goes. This is how this goes. And see, now I can say the mistakes that we made over in North Lawndale that I won't have to make those same mistakes over here because you know by me learning over there. Now I'm able to say, hey, let's do this process instead of uh, doing a pre-circle and probably not meeting with the participant for over a month or so, not knowing we're going to get in touch with them at all, we're going to do this pre-circle and get him in the next, get the participant in the next week. And so when I came over there, so I sat down with the team, hey, this is how we're going to do this, this is how we're going to do that. And so by me doing that, so with this being over here in Inglewood, within two years, we've been able to dismiss over 60 cases. Yeah, and you were talking about like getting gun charges in as yeah. well. And, you know, what it, a, a cliche that gets thrown around and, you know, might, maybe new or maybe something that people have heard. Um, like mm -hmm. it, in a situation like Chicago, right, the people who are carrying guns are also the people who are at the most risk of yes. having guns yes. uh, used against them, right? And so, again, thinking about relationship with self, of course, like we don't want them carrying guns. Um, in general, guns cause harm, but we don't want you to be in circumstances where you feel that you need that. So what are the things that we can do to help you um, make choices or like give you options that will allow you to have a different kind of life? Um, it, it's, a, it's a really beautiful thing. And, you know, yes. kudos to you for both being the person who is able to facilitate those processes even yes. more kudos to you for being the person who's been able to deal with all the other drama, <laughs> all the other politics, all the other relationships. Um, yes. I, I, you know, Thank I'm not you. trying to, I'm not trying to uh, demonize, vilify anybody who is. Oh no, we just know it was a, 
We're not trying because everybody from the North Lawndale court, I still have great relationship with, love them. And they know that still in contact, still in contact with them. But they, we all know it was some challenges over there. It was some challenges. But we overcame them, but it was some challenges. We know that. And we knew we, we knew we was going to have some challenges by it being the first court. We knew that. Yeah, for, for sure. And, you know, I'm deciding whether or not to name names, and I'm not going to name names. But, you know, talking to people who are in the position of judge and talking to them about the ideas of abolition. And when we talk about abolition being like building a world without the need for policing in prisons, building a world without the need for courts, like, you know, folks, on, there are folks on that side um, who are employed by the state, who are acting as people of the state, who are like philosophically aligned <laughs> with building that world. Um, but we do have this system as it exists. And like, who would we rather have as judges? Who would we rather have as prosecutors? Who would we rather have as DAs? Who would we rather have as deputies, right? Um, as much as we want to say, like, abolish it all now, tear it all down, reallocate all of the resources, like, that's not exactly the reality that we get to live in. And so, you know, respect to the folks who are inside the system who are, like, making things making things better for, for individuals while we still need to be doing this uh, reimagination of and, and the the proactive work of building those systems, uh, building those resources, allocating those resources so like these kids aren't having to experience this in the first place. You know, we've mentioned uh, a handful oh. of times that, that, that you're a parent, right? Um, how has restorative justice, learning about restorative justice impacted the way that uh, you are with your with your kid? Wow, great. Oh, wow. So it just let me know uh, not to be judgmental because as a parent, you know, our job for me, my job as a father is to try to teach. And so now sometimes as restorative justice and, you know, me being a father, one of my biggest things, because it comes from my father, is it was like discipline. It's not just talking about hitting or nothing like that, but just the discipline part. But as I'm doing restorative justice, it's allowing me to just hear her part now. Okay? Like, I might not agree with it, but as I'm listening to understand it, just like uh, we had a talk, I think she was maybe like 14, and she was talking about like an iPhone. And I know when I was coming up, my mother wasn't finna buy me no $1,000 phone. It wasn't, wasn't happen. But a restorative justice, it, it has allowed me to just listen. So when she said that we can't have androids, and I'm like, what? Like, like no, you can't have androids. Because I have an android. And I'm like, okay, what are you talking about? You can't have no androids. She's like, yeah, nobody in school have androids. And so when I actually went and did a circle, I said, let me test this out. I said, so I pulled my phone. I said, how many of y'all in here got Androids? Not one kid raised their hand. It was like, Android? Like, Android? Like, dude, don't nobody do no Androids? What are you talking about? And so by me doing restorative justice, it allowed me to listen to her more openly and be not judgmental and not try to say what's best for her and by allowing me to listen to her to say she was right. She really can't have an android going to school. She was right. Get that green bubble shame. Right. <laughs> <laughs> she was right. And she said she had that. I cannot send no messages and it come back green. Everybody knows it's like it's not going to happen. And so when I did get an android, she would always get in the car and like give it right back to me, like, like, she would just use it to talk to me and text me, let me know when I'm going to pick up from school. She would never use it. And so I was like, wow, this is insane to me. Like, I would be her age and just be happy to have a phone. But, like, restorative justice has allowed me to realize, to listen to something that I might not think is right or wrong, but just to listen now. And so when I listen, and she was right. I mean, and I listened to her and I paid attention to the school. I just went on ahead and bought an iPhone. Yeah. I mean, like, while we're not talking about this is the one time that, like, she caused harm or you caused harm, right? <laughs> like, this ability to, you know, think about the relationship, think about her needs of, like, feeling belonging amongst her peers, right? Like, that's a real need. Like, I, I, one, 
iPhone owner and like this whole conversation is a tribute to Steve Jobs, Tim Cook, and like the, the brand that they've <laughs> built, right? Right. But like and like we can laugh and say like this is like trivial, some like it's really not important, but like those like senses of belonging matter to people. Like the the actual hardware that you're holding in your hand doesn't matter. But like if you're feeling a sense of loneliness, alienation, not belonging because of the phone that you hold, um, what are the things that we can do to like help you be in right relationship with folks, right? There's a whole yes. other conversation about like, you know, why her friends are judging her for that or like why she feels like that's some kind of isolation. But like for the purposes of like your relationship with your daughter, right? Like that was a thing. And you know, another parent who doesn't necessarily think um, in this way where you're listening and like open to like things that were outside of the experience that you had growing up, like you wouldn't have that, you know, you haven't just taught financial literacy. Like you, you did uh, teach parenting classes for a while. Like how did you I like did. infuse restorative justice into those? Oh, that's a great, great. Yeah. So one thing I always did when I did my parenting groups was I always would show them how a peace circle would work and just letting them know that, hey, you could also use this with your families. You know, let's just sit down and just say, because, you know, um, for a lot of parents, you know, we so we, we do things the way we were taught. And uh, what I learned in restorative justice and doing parenting is we have to start listening more. Because I come from the generation where, man, you do what I told you to do. Don't ask me no questions. That's over with. That them days is over with now. Them those, those days is over with now. So now I'm with like, like I'm doing restorative justice and I'm doing this parenting. I'm showing them, hey, no, nah, maybe you should listen. Maybe, hey, you need to understand why they get on Facebook, why they on this social media. Because one thing in parenting that it's proven is that the influence now is stronger than parenting. And people say, well, how? No, I, I know my kid. I know he, no, you don't. You know, you don't. And, you know, I thought the same thing. I know my daughter. I know my daughter. And she showed me, no, you don't. Like, and so the reason how I use my restorative justice with my parenting is that active listening. Let me hear you out. What, let me, let me listen. Let me just not even try to just always, and, is trying to always solve something that goes wrong for her. Let me let me hear her out. Let me see how she gonna deal with this. Mm. Let me see why she's saying she need a three hundred dollar pair of shoes. Yeah, cause I went through that, David. Your you you be your time coming, and um, I was just listening, like, and then what it also allows me to do is. When, when it's time for me to respond and say, hey, okay, I heard you. Now you hear me. Now I had a situation where all her friends wanted to buy some shoes. These shoes to go to this party. And she had the money for it. So I said, Mariah, you want to buy some shoes for one night? You want to spend all your money? Oh, I got to have it. I got to. I said, Mariah, I don't think everybody going to have these shoes for this one party. No, they got this already. They got this. I said, okay. So we go and we buy the shoes. She gets to the party. She realizes it's only her and another girl that got the other parents. Oh, you're not finna waste no money. You're not finna do this. And so back before restorative justice, I would have just said no and stuck to it. But now since I'm doing these peace circles, it's allowed me to listen and just, okay. So when she went and I seen that she and another girl only had them out of 10 of them, when she came back in, I said, so why everybody didn't have the shoes? Oh, her mama ain't let her get it because she said it's only a one night thing. And I shouldn't even get it. I said, oh, okay. Uh, so I told you that from the beginning. So what's the lesson that is? I should have just went and did what I wanted to do and save my money. Exactly. And so restorative justice has allowed me to just listen actively more, especially being a parent and allow me to help her and also for her to help me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I would say like, I'm not looking forward to those days, but like, you know, like knowing that I have the skills and the mindset and <laughs> the, the ability Ooh. to have those conversations um, is, you know, something that I'm really grateful for. And thank you for sharing, you know, how that, yeah. and, and, you know, I think, you know, 
I should also shout out, like, you know, the reason that, like, she has that money for herself that she could buy that is because, like, you've taught her, like, good financial <laughs> financial literacy skills. So, like, you know, more big ups to you. Um, yeah, appreciation. <laughs> are there, uh, is there anything else uh, in the work that you've been doing around restorative justice that I've missed? I don't think you, we, we touched on it all, David. Just, um, I've been doing a lot of trainings lately. Um, and just, uh, like I say, from restorative justice has allowed me to do financial literacy. And, uh, you know, you know, my daughter got her own t-shirt brand. I am going to send you the link, David. Uh, I'm sending you the link. I want to see you at one. Um, and just, uh, yeah, just to help, just and it, it allowed me to just like I say, I branched off, and I'm also just gonna start doing mentorship. I went and got my life coach. I took a life coach class, so I got my life coach certificate, and so I'm gonna start doing that. Uh, sounds good, and you know, even t t send me the link. We'll put the link in the show notes for people. Yes, to, man, appreciate it. It's, it's popular loner, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. See, I know, I know. I say, um, yeah, I know, but you, I need you. <laughs> I, 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 you're right. You got, you got my commitment on air. I'll, I'll get that. I'll get that shirt. Y'all um, hear that world? I'm holding him to that. <laughs> Y'all hear that? that this on video. For those of you who are listening, just on podcast, we're on YouTube now. Make sure that you subscribe and you know yeah. hold me accountable to you know rep, rep <laughs> that, that shirt. Uh, next, yeah. episode, probably not next episode, but in in the near future. Um. As we've heard, so much about doing this work is the practice, but it's always great to have some fundamentals. So if you want to tap into the Intro to RJ, Racial and Restorative Justice course, the link to engage in that learning is in the show notes. If you want to go deeper in your practice or explore other aspects of doing work that is restorative and building a better world for future generations, we have learning opportunities for you too, both in courses and live workshops. If you're in a community, school, or organization that would benefit from this learning, we're more than happy to get on a call with you to talk about how we can support this work in your context. In addition to rating, reviewing, and subscribing to this podcast, amplification of this work also means sharing these learning opportunities with others. So if there are individuals in your life who you want to really know this work in a deep and meaningful way, and you've found the things that you've heard here on this podcast really relevant, please send them our way. It's how we literally amplify the work. Now back to the questions that everybody answers when they come on these airwaves. Great. So questions that everybody answers when they're on the podcast. We've talked around it. But in your own words, can you define restorative justice? Oh, it's easy for me. I always tell people building relationships. Mm. That's it. Building relationships. I don't need a long definition. Building relationships. Yeah. Um, in your, you know, experience doing this work over the past couple of years, what has been like, oh, shit moment, like a moment where you either you messed up or like you wish you had done something different? Oh, and what did you oh learn my from God, it? David. Oh, I'm actually I'm actually working on a book on restorative justice called Restore, Repair, Reflect. Make sure I'm gonna have it done by probably April, May. So yeah, be on the lookout for that. We're doing it well, yeah. Restore, repair, reflect. So and this What's is one actually of these in reflections, the book. yeah. Yeah, so this is actually in the book, y'all know I'm explaining this. So I was doing the peace circle with Pam and Cheryl. We was at uh Press Blood doing the training. And we did uh when you put, your, put the person's name on the back and they have to guess who it is. And the person was Caitlyn Jenner. And so, you know, am I black? Am I white? Am I male? Am I female? You know, you ask, am I, am I, am I, am I? So it came to, am I, man, am I a man? Some people was like, yes. Some people said no. But... It was a woman there who was part of the LGBTQ community. She snapped. She was like, no, no, no. That is a woman. And if y'all are going to do this, I do not want to be here. Blah, blah, blah. She got real loud. And I'm like, oh, my God. But it was a pastor there. And he like, no, <laughs> no. That's a man. He was born a man. So I'm sitting there like, oh, shit. I'm like, how how are we going to do this? And she was like, well, I don't want to be a part of this. And she was loud. And Pam looking, Cheryl looking, I'm looking. 
I'm like, what are we about to do? So I'm like, okay, okay, y'all. So we try to get everybody settled. So not everybody is, well, you know, I feel if you're born the man, this, this, and I feel that this, and you got this saying, well, they have the personal transition, we have to respect it. So I'm sick. I'm like, oh, God, man, I ain't never went through nothing like this. And it's funny because me and uh, Cheryl was talking about it. I mean, Pam was talking about it the other day. And so what we did was we took an early lunch, and I went, and I sat with Pam and Cheryl, and I said, listen, y'all, we have to come out with an apology. We have to. We have to apologize to her because she's absolutely right. And it's past all our personal views or however we deal with things, but y'all know we have to keep things restorative. And so when we came back, we issued an apology. We talked to the whole, every 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 participant that was part of the circle. And uh, she spoke on it. The, the uh, part participant spoke on it. She accepted the apology and we was able to go on and complete the four-day training. So that was the most challenging circle I've ever been a part of. Mm-hmm. You know, what would you have done differently? I wouldn't have done the game. I wouldn't have put no Caitlyn Jenner on him while he's back because yeah, I well, didn't think it. I didn't think it through. I, we didn't think it through. Yeah. I well, yeah. There, there's so many reflections that I have. Like, you know, the, the original question is like, what was the moment? You you got the moment, but like, what's the reflection? Like, what what would you have done differently? What what have you learned? And you know, speaking to gender issues, right? You know, I know Pam, I know Cheryl, um, and you know, rest in peace, Aura. Um, yes. You know, inclusivity is such a big part. And then when there's somebody who, I think there are two levels of this. When somebody is like vocally like against <laughs> um, the LGBTQ community, one that person's opinion. Um, is harmful and hurtful, but it's their opinion and it's their story. Yes. And in a circle, right, they're a full person that we want to include. At the same time, we can't, um, we need to make it a space where like everyone feels included, right? And so like, while we have people who have opposing views in circle, like the goal of the circle is not to solve uh, people's like beliefs about like yeah. uh, the validity of people who uh, transition um, or, or, or who are trans, but, you know, thinking about that ahead of time, not knowing the beliefs of the people, like would say like, yeah, like maybe we should steer clear of this. Um, I mean like in a moment, right. We could also say like, does this person, um, not fit into the, like the gender binary as a question, right. Um, I mean, I know that framing the question might've like activated somebody else in the space, but you know, there's no like one right way to, to address those issues. Um, but like, it is something to like really be considerate of, like, even when you're doing things that are games and are supposed to be like easy, light and fun, like there's always a potential that harm can happen. And, you know, knowing the three of you, the way that I know the three of you, like the way that like, you know, you, you know, you know, you pause, you make the apologies, um, you allow the folks in the room to be able to express um, what they feel about it, right? It's not like, hey, we're just shutting this down and end of conversation, right? Like that that's so restorative. And, you know, thank you so much for sharing. This is going to be the YouTube. Yeah, I'm I just sure. here thinking about that circle, like, oh my God, like, and you know, I I look, I look up to Cheryl and I'm like, the, 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 the gods of restorative justice. And we was all sitting there like, oh my God, like, what do we do? And so it was just so challenging. But yeah, David, like, like you said, well, I have done differently. I would have thought it out. And see, mm-hmm. I didn't think, I mean, even because, uh, you know, it was all of our idea. So, but I didn't think about what if it offends somebody. I didn't think about that. I was just thinking about, we just going to have fun. And okay, this is a person that transitioned. It was once a man and is now a, a woman. I didn't think about that I, I didn't think about that. I just thought it would be just funny because I thought, oh, maybe some man song would say, yes, he's a man song. We would just laugh and blah, blah, blah. But I didn't think about uh, it might be hurtful to somebody that's a part of the LGBTQ community. I didn't think about that. So if I had a really thought it out thoroughly, I was like, no, we can't do that. Not, not Cho- that. Chosen a different name. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. We want to show a different name for sure. But. Um, I'm going to tell you the good part about it, though, David. The good part about it was it was a learning curve. Yeah. It was a learning curve. And it lets me know if a tough situation come up, how to handle it. Definitely. 
definitely yeah. definitely um you get to sit in circle with four people living or dead who are they and what is the one question you ask the circle Ooh, wow great question living or dead wow four people living jay-z would be one barack obama would be two my grandmother would be three and she's deceased or would be my daughter. Yeah, I'll put my daughter in that. Mm. And what is the question you would ask that circle? What do what what did it take for you to get to where you at and the obstacles? Oh no, wait a minute. Oh God, if I had one question, I got Jay-Z, I got Barack, I got her, I got Brian. Hmm. What oh, okay, I got it, I got it. What what did it take to be what did it take for you to be where you are and why does people love you so much? Mm -hmm. The benefit of you not having listened to this podcast before is with this question I turn it back to you. So what did it take for you to be where you are, Fred, and why do people love you so much? Oh wow. That's deep. Wow, I like how you did that. <laughs> wow. Oh wow. <laughs> wow. Hmm. Mm. I will say being authentic and then and, and just showing genuine love. I'm I'm authentic everywhere I go. I don't hold no punches. I am who I am. Mm. Wow. Mm. That's the Dave. I like how you did that. <laughs> you know, I'm a you. you know, I'm a you. That I'm letting you know. Yeah. Feel free. I mean, I took it from somebody else, so <laughs> feel free. Um, and you I know, you know. It. We're mentioning, you know, your book coming out. You've got a podcast that will be coming out. The yes, podcast. everything is coming 2023. And I'm going to need you on that. Definitely. We'll, we'll get that in. We'll even like retroactively put it in the show notes when that's when that's out and available. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, who's one person that I should have on the podcast? And uh, you have to help me get them on. Hmm. You, you have Robert on this podcast? Mm -hmm. oh, he's been on here. I gotta watch it, man. Okay, let me see. Oh, oh. you had Derek on the podcast. Yep. Oh wow, he's been on here. Wow, you had everybody. Oh, I've had wow. Derek, I've had Cheryl, I've had Pam, I've had. Let me think. Oh, I got one for you. I got a young brother named JVI. I work with in the court, right? And he had a he had a case, a gun case through the court, and uh, I, it was something about him. And then I told the judge, I said, hire him as a circle keeper. I have to, I get him trained and everything. And man, this young this young brother took the financial literacy class. He got his own L L LLC. Man, he's a circle keeper at the court. Man, he 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 rent. He got his own little car line. Man, he's great. And I get him on his you. I love that. He's love a he's a he's you. a person. He's a person from. He's a product of the restorative justice community court, and he's doing great work. Man. Beautiful. Well, yeah, love to make that connection with him. I'll make it sure. happen. I will right, make right. it happen for sure. Beautiful. And so we've mentioned a handful of the things that you're doing in the world. Um, how can people support you, your work, um, and the ways that you want to be supported? Oh, wow. Uh, hey, go please go to the website, www.popular-apparel.com. Please shop with us, you know. It's my daughter's clothing line. She has a great line. Uh man, it's it's supporting our youth. I would love that. You can catch me on Facebook at Bashan Cooper. That's B-A-S-H-A-U-N Cooper. I'm on Facebook. I'm also on LinkedIn as Frederick Cooper. That's F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K Cooper on LinkedIn. You can see all the work that I do, all the circles, everything on LinkedIn. And it would be it would be just amazing for you, you guys to support it. Beautiful. I mean, and we'll have all that linked in the show notes, both yeah. the ways that connect with you, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, and, you know, support the brand, support the popular apparel. Um, Fred, thank you so much for being David, on this much love to Justice you. Life. Um, for those listening, I uh, hope you learned. I know you learned. We'll be back with an, another episode of Someone Living This is Sort of Justice Life next week. Until then, take care. Thank you. Like what you heard? Please subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast on whatever platform you're using right now. Or if you're old school, tell a friend. It really helps us further amplify this work. 
You can also support us by following us on our social platforms, signing up for our email list, signing up for a community gathering, workshop, or course. So many options. Links to everything in the show notes or on our website, amplifyrj.com. Thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.